So it's better to start because uh, today we have lots of things to do. Uh, first, we had to concentrate in now three hours, two different lectures that perhaps each one takes two hours. And the other thing, we have the midterm today. So I will make two lectures of slightly more than 45 minutes, maybe 60 minutes so that we then have uh, free time for the midterm at the end. Uh, and today we have to talk about two quite different things, but they are still related. Uh, we didn't discuss with antennas. One, the first term we avoided all, all, all of the time. All of the time it was present, but we avoided it. Was the, the issue of polarization how to define the polarization of an antenna. And the other thing we have to talk about is thermal noise. It causes interference to uh, our radio communication and actually limits the range of our radio communication. So let's see first uh, how to define polarization. And the first issue is coordinates. what kind of coordinates to use. And with polarization, in electrical engineering, we always uh, take as a reference for, co for coordinates our antenna. Not in physics. Physicists do it in a different way. But we are electrical engineers and we usually have antennas, have to deal with antennas. So we take our antenna. Maybe a waveguide, maybe a coaxial line here, but uh, coming from the generator. And uh, if this is the aperture of the antenna, it's probably radiating a main lobe in this direction. Now, how to put the axis of our coordinate system? We always put the axis in the direct uh, axis z in the direction of the main lobe. Lobe of the radiation pattern. Uh, and we do not look actually at the direction of propagation of the radio waves. So this antenna may be uh, transmitting, and now it's clear how it is done, but may also be receiving. So uh, received radiation goes the other way around, and uh, we still keep the coordinate system aligned to the antenna, not to the radiation. And that's important to understand. Uh, the other two axes to form uh, uh, orthogonal three-dimensional coordinate system, the other two axes are here. Uh, we could call them x and y, the other two axes. Uh, we, us we usually call them vertical axis and horizontal axis. Uh, so our coordinates will be vertical, horizontal, and uh, z. This is about our coordinate system. And they are always li uh, linked, they are also, uh, the, these coordinates are always reference to the radiation beam of the antenna, regardless whether this antenna is receiving or transmitting. That doesn't matter. We always relate our coordinates to the antenna. Uh, now, how to describe uh, uh, polarization? What are we actually transmitting with our antenna? We are, with our antenna, we are transmitting an electric field, and this electric field can be decomposed in a vertical component, vertical, and a horizontal component. Uh, so to decompose, I'm not drawing vector signs with e vertical and e horizontal uh, uh, because uh, the directions are now in the vertical axis, in the horizontal axis. Uh, how many variables are there involved in polarization? So this is an electric field. An electric field is a, uh, uh, is a phasor quantity in uh, 
in the frequency domain. We always, always talk about antennas in the frequency domain. So this is a phasor quantity. It has a magnitude and a phase. Now also the vertical and horizontal component have uh, two components. Uh, have a, a real and imaginary components. Here these two components. So in total, if I decompose the electric field vector in the vertical and horizontal component, now each of these has its real and imaginary part or its magnitude and its phase angle. But in total, we have four components. So we have four, four, four variables. We have two here. We have two here. Now, uh, this thing actually does not describe the polarization. It describes more than just the polarization of the antenna. Because our generator, if it produces a voltage here, a voltage is also the magnitude of the voltage times its phase angle. So uh, we also have two variables already here that are unrelated to the polarization because whatever generator do we have here, uh, these are totally independent, independent of the, our antenna, independent of how are we going to describe the polarization. Uh, one way we could do it, could describe the polarization, so how do we get the vertical and horizontal components, uh, E vertical and E horizontal, I simply make a dot product of electric field times, uh, not times, but dot, dot uh, the vertical unit vector and electric field dot the horizontal unit vector. To get the components of a vector, I make dot products with, uh, with unit vectors in the uh, corresponding uh, directions. There is no Z component because uh, electromagnetic waves are transversal, transversal waves. Transversal waves do not have a longitudinal component. There is no longitudinal component, so there is no Z component. There is nothing to care about the third coordinate, the Z, the way we define these things. Uh, what can we do to remove the dependence of the generator? Well, this electric field AE, I could write it as, as uh, some direction 1E uh, times uh, a proportionality factor, uh, magnitude and phase of our generator. So there are already two. So this already brings me two component, uh, two uh, variables, and another two variables are here, two variables. Though uh, this is a unit vector, a unit vector. Once I know its direction, its direction is just the angle of this unit vector. Uh, it looks like that there is just one variable hidden in here. But uh, what we are going to do today, we are going to extend our understanding of vectors. Uh, vectors may also be complex. And if this vector is complex, then there are two variables hidden in it. So how I get the information about the polarization of this antenna? One very simple uh, attempt is to make uh, the EH over EV to make the ratio of the two uh, components vertical and horizontal. Uh, this is a very simple way to go. So this ratio, this ratio only has now two components left. This ratio is a ratio of two complex numbers. A ratio of two complex numbers has its real part and its imaginary part. It is only describing the, uh, it is only describing the, uh, the polarization because if I calculate it, if I calculate it out of here, uh, I write here, I rewrite this equation one e, uh, uh, some proportionality factor, uh, volt, uh, magnitude of the voltage and phase angle of the generator, also one e uh, alpha uh, uh, u. So I should write u here, u e to the uh, multiplied by the dot product with 1h and 1v. So now it is clear that in this uh, uh, ratio between vertical and horizontal component, 
the generator cancels out because it's both in the uh, numerator and in the, in the denominator. Of the ratio. So here it cancels out, and here I really get out all the information about my uh, about my polarization, uh, knowing that this one e is uh, maybe complex, maybe a complex number, maybe a complex vector. Uh, this could be done, could be used, but it's a little bit unpractical. We are trying to use practical units where polarization matters, how to make this practical. And this uh, ratio of uh, vertical and horizontal component, it's clearly defined, but it's impractical to be used. That's the only problem here, but, but it works. Uh, we, we can also invert uh, vertical and horizontal. We can also change them, between ratio or one over its ratio. Just that we have the ratio that we know what, it, what this ratio means. We could also exchange this two. Uh, this ratio is also called, uh, uh, called the linear polarization ratio. What is linear polarization? What is this? Uh, linear polarization means that this uh, unit vector or, or, or vector of the electric field or its unit vector, 1e, only has one direction. Uh, like here in this simple drawing, it seems to have just one direction. So uh, uh, this unit vector here for linear polarization, this should be, uh, this guy here should be real. What is, what is not linear polarization? What is different from linear polarization? Different from linear polarization is that this uh, vector, actually with time, it rotates uh, following a circle or following an ellipse. But uh, this vector for its representation then requires one, uh, uh, then requires a whole plane to describe it. Well, linear polarization means that uh, this vector here only oscillates in time along a line. And that's, th that line is called linear. It does not mean that we have nonlinear components here. It means linear means that uh, the polarization vector only oscillates over a straight line. That's the meaning. And now we have to go further on and to see what is more practical to define. This was not very practical. What we have here. This was not particularly practical. And the more practical definition is to define two complex unit vectors. Uh, one left and one right. Uh, we define them with our known vectors, one v, v and one h. So we define one left. And 1v and 1h are real vectors here. They represent linear polarization that are completely, they are completely real. 1v is 1v plus uh, uh, j1h. Uh, in order to be a unit vector, I have to divide this by square root of 2. And 1r is 1v minus j1h. Uh, also divided by the square root of 2 to make it a unit vector. So these two vectors, they have unit magnitude. If I take this one squared, absolute squared, plus this one absolute squared, divided by square root of 2, these are unit vectors. Now, how do I make the scalar product, the dot product right now? I have to be very careful here. With complex vectors, say A and B, actually the dot product is A uh, dot B complex conjugated. This is very important because uh, 
In order to have, if I have a complex number A, say, the complex number A, its magnitude will be uh, A absolute value squared, or in other words, this is uh, A uh, times A conjugated, in the same way. And if I do it this way, then I get things correctly, like uh, 1 left times 1 left complex conjugated, what it is, it is, so I have square root of 2, uh, 1 uh, v uh, plus uh, j1 h uh, multiplied by the second uh, ratio is square root of 2, 1 v minus one, j1 one, uh, h, uh, because complex conjugated flips the sign of the imaginary part of the vector. And if I make this calculation, now this is square root of 2 times square root of 2 is 2. 1v uh, times 1v is 1. 1v times minus j1h. v and h are uh, orthogonal. So 1v with real vectors, 1v dot 1v, this is a unit vector, is 1. But 1v, real vector, it's a lot of real numbers, so calculation is simple. 1v dot 1h is equal to 0 because the vectors are orthogonal. So this time, uh, this multiplied by this is orthogonal is 0. This multiplied by this is orthogonal is 0. But plus j times minus j is just plus 1. So it is plus 1. And this is 1. And that's what I was looking for. This one left vector is... Uh, exactly uh, is exactly a unit vector. Uh, let me tell that this uh, selection, what is one left, and what is left and what is right? It's uh, what is left and what is right is our arbitrary cho choice, what we like to call left and what we can call right. So this is the electrotechnical or IEEE definition. Beware, physicists over there use just the opposite definition. For physicists, this is left and this is right. Where is the reason for doing so? Uh, if I look at a right wave, polarized wave, uh, I have, I have the, the demo with a water gun shown on YouTube, we cannot make the demo with the water gun here because everyone is going to get wet here. <laughs> if we take a water gun, uh, if the wave propagates in that direction, then right hand means this direction, right hand screw, I turn the right hand screw in this direction and the screw advances in this direction. So this is, this is the right hand definition Electrotechnical definition because electrotechnical engineers are engineers and engineers use screws and know they know what a right-handed screw is. Except for some bicycle wa valves, we mainly use right-handed screws. Some bicycle wa Italian bicycle valves use also left-handed screws. To be accurate. Uh, what do physicists think? Physicists don't know anything about antennas. So they look at this wave, so this thing is turning this direction and it's advancing this direction. If this thing is advancing now in this direction, if I look at this thing turning, so turning, here is turning in the right hand, and if I look at the, uh, with the right-handed screw, with the right-handed screw I said, uh, horizontal is delayed with respect to vertical. Uh, minus j means delay. Yes, it looks like a right-handed screw. But if this is thing is moving, so this one is moving in space, the next one will be here, 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 as this is moving around. And actually, the tips of the unit vectors of the right-hand unit vector actually uh, describe a left-handed spiral in space. And that's the reason why physicists call this left-hand 
We call it right hand, IEEE, uh, physicists call it left, left hand. Be careful about these definitions. So now what can we do with our polarization? Again, we can think about such a ratio. We define the E left-handed component and E right-handed component. How we define them? So it's the total vector E scalar product with one left but uh, it requires complex conjugation here. One right uh, with complex conjugation here. Complex conjugation in order to get the dot product correctly. We can define them out now and now we can define the ratio of circular components. We usually use the letter Q here. Uh, as uh, E left over E right. Okay, also in the Q, uh, if I wrote the same equation here, also in the Q, the generator actually uh, cancels out. The generator, the generator magnitude and phase cancels out. So Q actually includes two variables, two real variables. Uh, or a complex number, a, co a complex number is made out of two real variables. And uh, uh, it only describes the polarization, it, it, it describes this it, it, it in, a, in a quite a useful way. Uh, why this ratio of circular components? Uh, we also call these things uh, in English literature, we call it left hand circular polarization and right hand circular polarization. This is typical. Why is this useful? Well, what we want to actually remove here, we have to, we would like to remove the dependence of the, on the definition of our coordinates. Now, uh, X is Z, that's very well defined with the main beam of the antenna. Uh, but X is V and H are not so well defined Say if we ask the Chinese where does actually V point, the Chinese would say there. In China, the vector V points there because China is down there. So that's a problem. Well, we have some uh, uh, definitions saying satellites. Uh, with satellites, with artificial satellites, we usually define these things as with the North Pole. So with satellite, if this is the Earth, and we have a geostationary satellite here, we define the direction V in the direction of the axis of the Earth in the north. Uh, we have, the satellite is probably pointed to the Earth, so axis Z points to the Earth, so axis H points outside here, outside of my board. Uh, if I have a receiving station, say here, for this receiving station, whatever are its coordinates, but I know what is vertical. It's not related vertical to the receiving station because receiving stations may be anywhere on the Earth. It's related to the satellite and to the rotation of the Earth because uh, a geostationary satellite is always located in the equatorial plane here. And now we have the coordinate system defined. This is what is usually done with satellites. Uh, so this uh, ratio of uh, circular components, uh, it's actually very useful because if I rotate V and H around the z-axis, if, if I define them in a different way, for instance, for the Chinese, uh, then only the phase of the Q changes, not the magnitude. Just the phase, and that's already useful, at least the magnitude of Q is uh, the magnitude of this uh, ratio of circular components uh, uh, does not depend on the particular choice of V and H. And that for us is very useful. It's a little bit lots of theory here, but now we see what we can do. Uh, I will make also a broad example here how to do things. Now, the next issue is how to measure our unknown antenna. We have an unknown antenna here connected to a generator. 
Now, how I measure the radiation out of this antenna? Coming out of this antenna. And uh, here to measure the radiation, uh, it is typical. So, what about the antennas I can make? Uh, linear polarization. So, uh, electric field only oscillating the uh, the tip of the electric field vector only oscillating along a straight line uh, are relatively easy to make because I can make my antenna out of wire and the electric field will always follow track exactly uh, the direction of the wire. Uh, it's much more difficult to make circularly polarized antennas and uh, we, we will see several examples over there how to make circularly polarized antennas. But on frequently circularly polarized antennas are very, uh, are very useful in some, in some applications. So here I have a linearly polarized antenna. And I have a voltmeter just uh, showing the magnitude of the voltage, not the phase, because I have no relationship to the generator. And I turn this antenna. So the, this dipole. Uh, is still remains perpendicular to the direction to the, my transmitting antenna, but I turn to check the polarization. And what do I have? Do I see here uh, the voltage U here? I see the voltage U I get, and it, this is the angle. Uh, I turn the dipole for the whole angle up to two pi. What I can see here. I, here I can see two maxima and two minima. <coughs> so it's a not, not particularly nice drawing. Could I make it, we could make it better, so this way. So this should be symmetrical, but. Uh, I see twice in one rotation, one complete rotation, I see two maximum. And here I see the minimum value. Two minima. And what I can easily measure right, right now is the ratio between the maximum voltage and the minimum voltage I see with my receiver. And this is called the axial ratio. The axial ratio is frequently given in dB. Since it's a ratio of voltages, it's uh, 20 times the logarithm on the base. Okay. So R in decibels is now 20 times logarithm uh, logarithm to the base 10 of uh, u max uh, over u minimum. Uh, this is something I can easily measure. What I miss here, still I miss the particular position of the maxima. So I don't, I didn't specify what the phase angle here phi is. If I didn't specify, specify this angle, I cannot retrieve the phase of Q. What is the relationship between maxima and minima? So this uh, R can now be rewritten as 1 plus uh, the absolute value of Q, 1 minus the absolute value of Q. Uh, this holds at least when it holds as long as uh, the um, denominator is positive. So it holds for Q uh, less than 1 or it holds for polarizations, uh, circular or elliptical po uh, polarizations uh, in the right hand sense. In the left hand sense, of course, I should add a mi minus sign. So in the left hand sense, I should, should just take the absolute value here. 1 plus Q, uh, 1 
minus q. And again, an absolute value on the outside. Uh, what does that mean? It means that the single measured axial ratio, also may be expressed in dB, I can do the reverse calculation. I can try to find out the, uh, what the actual ratio of circular components is. So if I invert this equation, if I invert it here, what I get out, I get R1 uh, minus Q is equal to 1 plus Q. And now I'm trying to solve the equation for Q. Uh, so it's here it's R, is this term, uh, minus 1 is equal to what on the other side? On the other side, so if I take this one here, if I take Q here, here is Q. I have 1 here and I have minus Q times R here. So uh, uh, here I have R plus 1. Okay, so I can take the absolute value of Q, I can calculate it out. This is now uh, R minus 1 over R plus 1. Uh, okay, uh, when does this hold? This holds, okay, only for right hand circular polarization. For left hand circular polarization, I have to take, uh, I have to flip the sign, uh, flip the sign here, uh, uh, not not here, but uh, flip the sign or uh, the. I should take one over Q over there. Uh, so uh, uh, for uh, left hand circular polarization, I should consider that Q is actually larger than one. Uh, so I have the relationship in both directions, but unfortunately, I only get here the magnitude of Q. I cannot get here the, uh, the phase of Q. Uh, I cannot get the phase of Q. And further with this measurement, I do not know whether the polarization is right-hand circular or left-hand circular. I do not know that because I have no information of the phase here with this voltmeter. So this is, this is a drawback. But uh, this axial ratio, usually, usually I know pretty well if this antenna is right hand or left hand. I just want to know how, how good it is. How good it is. And knowing how good right circular is or how bad right circular is, uh, I can find all this out of the axial ratio. can find anything else. Uh, so this is about the units we are using with polarization. Uh, now we have to look at uh, the radio link, the radio link itself. The radio link itself, I have a generator, I have a transmitting antenna here that has a Q of the transmitting antenna, and on the other side of the link, I have again an antenna that is only specified by its Q, Q receiving. Uh, and this one is connected to my receiver. Now, what is the equation governing this thing? We were talking about the freeze equation, if you know. If I have here gain of the transmitting antenna, if I have gain of the receiving antenna. Uh, so, uh, the power inside the receiver the received power should be what? Uh, if this is distance r, and we are uh, uh, outside the Fresnel zone in the far field region, in the Fresnel region, uh, so we can just write the freeze equation. So power in the receiver is power of the transmitter uh, times gain of the transmitting antenna, gain of the receiving antenna, and here I have lambda over 4 pi distance uh, and everything squared. Okay, this is just the freeze equation, but the freeze equation in one particular condition that we have polarization matching. I didn't say same polarization. I have said matching polarization 
on both ends of the antenna. If the polarizations do not match, then I have a further factor of efficiency here. And this is the polarization mismatch factor. And this polarization mismatch factor, of course, can go between, uh, can range be span between 0 and 1. 1 is perfect polarization matching. 0 is perfectly orthogonal polarization or total polarization mismatch. And this factor I can express this with the circular, uh, uh, circular uh, ratios of both the transmitting antenna and the receiving antenna because we define the ratio of the circular components here. And there's a formula how to calculate this. So this uh, polarization mismatch factor is now, uh, uh, oh sorry, normal parenthesis, 1 plus Q of the transmitter squared times 1 plus uh, Q of the receiver uh, squared, that's in the uh, denominator, and the numerator has a relationship like this, 1 uh, plus here Q transmitter, Q uh, receiver, absolute value squared. So we have the formula how to calculate uh, this uh, polarization mismatch factor here. This will fit here in my equation. So the total equation, the total, the complete freeze equation should account for an eventual polarization mismatch. And now, since this thing is getting complicated here, uh, let's try to make a, a table of known polarizations and try to write uh, all these things down. But I have to erase my desk here. prefer to leave this thing at least for some time on the desk so we know what we are doing. Uh, let's write now things down. So first, uh, in the first column of my table, I will describe what polarization do I have. And my first example will be vertical polarization. With vertical polarization, what I have uh, my field only has uh, my field only has a vertical component. If E only has a vertical component, here I get uh, one over square root of two, and here I also get one over square root of two. The ratio of this is exactly plus one. Plus one. This is Q now. The axial ratio, if I have a linear polarization, if I turn this linearly polarized receiving antenna around, I certainly get a spot when min, the minimum is exactly equal to zero. So the one, uh, whatever divided by zero is infinity. So here the axial ratio is infinity. So this uh, axial ratio can actually go in what uh, limits? the axial ratio may have limits between 1 and infinity. Or the axial ratio in dB can go from 0 dB again up to infinity. Though it's difficult to make more than 30 dB. Uh, no. no, 30 dB for Q. Uh, not for, for, for the axial ratio, it, it's very difficult to get close to zero here. That's what I want. OK. So now this is uh, R. Uh, let's see now the other polarization that's quite common. Uh, if I am using here horizontal polarization. Horizontal polarization. What is now Q? 
uh, E only has a horizontal component. But these two have the horizontal component of opposite sign. So I get here with one left, I get minus j over square root of 2, and here I get plus j over square root of 2. So q is now minus 1 for horizontal component. Uh, again, the axial ratio is infinity, because for a vertical receiving antenna, I receive nothing. I have division by 0 is infinity. Now, uh, the interesting question is, what if I couple these two antennas? So if I write here the receiving antenna. If I receive a vertical with vertical, what do I get out? Vertical to vertical is uh, plus 1, plus 1. So if I look here, what is now the, this efficiency or this uh, polarization mismatch or polarization matching factor? This is 1, this is 1. 1 times 1 is uh, 1. Plus 1 is 2. Squared is 4. This is 1. Uh, so this is 2 and this is 2. 4 divided by 2 divided by 2 is exactly 1. So the... Uh, uh, Matching factor here, vertical to vertical, is exactly one. Uh, one to, uh, if I have here right hand circular, uh, if I have a horizontal polarization here with the antenna, with horizontal polarization, what do I get out? With horizontal polarization, uh, horizontal is minus one, vertical is plus one. Minus one times plus one is minus one. 1 minus 1 is 0, squared is 0. So here, of course, uh, vertical to horizontal is 0. Or, in other words, uh, horizontal to vertical is also 0, but horizontal to horizontal is 1. And now we are fine. Now let's try a slightly different example. A right-hand circular polarization. Circular position. With the right hand circular position antenna, what is Q? Q should be exactly equal to zero. There is, there is no left hand uh, electric field from a right, an ideal right hand circular position antenna. So this is zero. What is now R? 1 plus 0, 1 minus 0 is 1. R is 1. The acceleration is 1. Uh, what is right hand to right hand circular polarization? Uh, Q is 0. I can put here the Q 0. Both Qs are 0 if I have a right hand to right hand. So uh, this is 2. Uh, this is actually 1. 1. 1 times 1 is 1. And this is also 1. So it's exactly 1 here. So right hand to right hand is perfect. This is matching polarization. What about the other combinations? Uh, right hand to vertical. Uh, vertical has the Q of 1. So is 0 times 1 is 0. Uh, plus 1 squared is 1. But I have here 1. And I have here 2 for the vertical receiver. So is 1 over 2 is 1 half. Here is 1 half. And of course, uh, also the, the other direction has the same relationship because the formula is completely symmetrical. What about uh, vertical to horizontal? Horizontal is minus 1. But still, the numerator is. 1, and the denominator is 2, is again 1 half. So I see here what loss do I get if I'm using a circularly polarized antenna uh, connected to vertical or horizontal. What about left hand? 
Left hand, uh, do I have another color? Yes, I mean this one here. Uh, left hand circular polarization. What is Q for left hand? Uh, for left hand, I only have left. I have nothing, right? I have zero in the denominator here. Uh, so it's infinity. Now it's a little bit tricky to cal make, cal make calculations with infinity. But a pure left hand uh, polarization has an acceleration of what? Uh, we said that for uh, left hand polarization, we have to use the absolute sign here is infinity over minus infinity absolute value of this. It's almost equal to 1. It's not an exact calculation, but of course, the left-hand circular polarization has, makes a perfect circle. Now, left-hand to vertical. Left-hand to vertical. I have uh, vertical has 1. So I have 1 plus infinity squared is infinity squared. Was plant infinity squared is infinity squared. So these two almost cancels out. But I have a factor of two here. I have one half. I have one half here. One half to vertical polarization. Uh, should also write it here. So left hand circular polarization. Uh, with left hand circular position, I have one half here, uh, two vertical, and I get the same result to horizontal because it's just minus one, but it's still the same one half in the uh, sorry, the red color, the red color, here. one half, and here is one half. Uh, left hand to left hand. Is infinity squared here, and squared was again infinity to the fourth power, infinity squared, infinity squared. If I could uh, just move a little bit away from that infinity and try to find the uh, the limit, the limit is one. Left hand to left hand works perfect, and left half to right right hand, I have infinity times zero here. This is not a number in the usual definition, uh, but it's somewhere close to one. But I have infinity squared here plus z uh, one square squared here. So it's something divided by infinity squared is zero. So uh, left hand to right hand goes with zero. And up to now, this table is simple. Now uh, let's see a slightly different case, but I need somewhat more space here on the desk. So at look, to look at some particular polarization, I have to draw the example here. Now, what happens if I have my polarization? So this is x is z out of the desk, x is v, uh, x is h. If I have, if I have uh, something polarized at 45 degrees. So linear polarization linear polarization at 45 degrees. This is a real vector, not a complex one, uh, but it is located at 45 degrees. So let's see now the example uh, linear polarization, 45 degrees. What is now the Q? What is now the R? OK, this is linear polarization. I can guess immediately that r must be equal to infinity. Because it's linear polarization, it has a deep 0 somewhere. But what is q? Uh, so this electric field here, this E, is actually has uh, its 1v uh, plus 1h. If it's 45 degrees, the same magnitude, divided by square root of 2, and no j. No j times uh, the uh, times uh, e without a vector sign. So this is the unit vector. The unit vector multiplied by left and multiplied by right. Uh, multiplied by left. Now this left multi multiplication is one minus because it conjugated 
1, uh, 1 v minus 1, uh, 1 v minus, uh, so this uh, e left what we will be e left and e uh, right if I make the multiplications. I have square root of 2 here, I have a square root of 2 here, so I have 1 half, one half uh, times e times e without, without a vector sign. And on top I have 1v times 1v is 1. And uh, minus j1h times uh, multiplied by 1h is minus j. minus j. And here I have 1 plus j for the other one. So the q, the ratio of these two complex numbers, these are a complex number, the ratio of this q, uh, if I draw it in the complex plane, uh, real, imaginary. So the numerator is here and the denominator is here. Uh, numerator and the denominator. So the ratio is minus j down here. So, uh, uh, no, sorry, this is the numerator, this is the denominator. It's twice the face angle, also, also the face angle is subtracted, so from this face angle is subtracting this one, and because I have 45 degrees here, minus 45 degrees, I have plus 45, but subtracting. Subtracting plus 45 from minus 45, I get to minus 90 degrees. Minus 90 degrees. So if I make the ratio now, uh, this is now minus j. Minus j. I can try now the efficiency here. What is the transfer efficiency? I have a minus j and I have 1 to the vertical. So this is minus j. 1 minus j, absolute value is square root of 2. Squared is 2. I have 2 here, 2 here. 4 in the uh, denominator, 2 in the numerator, so I have 1 half here. At 45 degrees, I just get 1 half of power. 2 vertical polarization, also 2 horizontal polarization. Uh, so if I have a linear polarization under 45 degrees, here what I get here. Uh, I said I get 1 half to both linear polarizations. Uh, to circular polarizations, uh, if I have a q equal to 0, if I have a q equal to 0, I have uh, 1 squared here, I have uh, two, uh, 2 down here, and I have 1, so it's also 1 half. Here it is also 1 half to circular polarization, right-hand circular, and I could derive a similar expression for the left-hand circular polarization. So left-hand circular polarization is now one half here and one half. But I have to make those calculations with infinity. Now, how about 45 transmitting antenna to 45 receiving antenna? 45 transmitting antenna, if the vector z is now my red pencil here and the, uh, the, uh, the electric field is now the green, this is a transmitter. Where is the receiver? The receiver should have its axis pointed towards the transmitter, the main lobe. This one at 45 degrees the direction, this one at 45 degrees the direction. What happens with these two? These two are now orthogonal. Let's look at the, my expression. If I put minus j in here, minus j times multiplied by minus j, is uh, minus 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. I have 0 in the uh, numerator. And uh, I have 4 in the denominator. So very important to understand. Now I have identical polarizations on both sides, but I have 0 power transfer. Identical polarization, but 0 power transfer. Do you understand that the, uh, now that the polarizations uh, have to be matching to have a radio link? Not identical, but matching. It, they were identical in the case of vertical, 
horizontal polarization, right hand circular, left hand circular, I have always, always one when I have identical polarization. But here with uh, polarization under 45 degrees, I ha uh, things are different. Here, matching polarizations are not identical polarizations. Uh, I could try also the, the other possibility, so uh, linear polarization under 135 degrees, so linear polarization at 135. This would give me J for Q. Okay, so uh, certainly I have infinity for the axial ratio. I have one half uh, to vertical, horizontal, right hand circular, left hand circular. I have uh, also here one half, one half, one half, one half uh, for linear polarization under 135 degrees. But 135 to 135 is zero because 135 on the transmitting side is down here and 135 on the receiving side is down here. So these two are orthogonal now for 135 degrees. Yes, I have just the final discussion here. With 45 degrees polarization, I have with uh, 135 to 45 is j times minus j times j. Minus j times j gives me 1 here. Uh, this is 2 squared makes 4, so it's exactly equal to 1. So I have matching polarization with two different polarizations at uh, 45 and 135 degrees. So it's not that, that simple, this table we got out. What we see from this table is that uh, there is no ideal polarization that could be received on any occasion. Every polarization has a zero somewhere. So for every possible polarization, there always exists the possibility of having uh, zero, zero power transfer. Uh, there is always one matching polarization, the matching polarization that gives me the strongest possible reception. Uh, what kind of polarizations are we going to use depends on the application. So how to get now circular polarization? A linear polarization is easy to make. A simple half-wave dipole is always linearly polarized. If the wire is straight, it can only radiate electric field in the direction of the wire. In the, if I have a straight piece of wire or a wave guide with just one, a rectangular wave guide with just one single mode, uh, then I always meet these requirements. But uh, there is no such device that would uh, naturally generate uh, circular polarization. Circular polarization is somewhat difficult to make and we will see some examples and we will see what, where is circular polarization useful. Uh, we are doing it for some purpose, not just, just for fun. Uh, so if we need circular polarization, certainly, certainly circular polarization is useful in space communication because in space it is actually difficult to define what is up, what is the direction of the axis V. So uh, what I can do is I take two dipoles, say half wave dipoles just, just to make it simple one in the direction of the axis V, the other dipole in the direction of the axis H. And I'm observing the polarization along the axis Z. How do I connect a generator now here? I have a generator. I connect it with one line to the vertical dipole line of the length L. And if I want right hand circular, uh, right hand circular should be delayed by a quarter period, 90 degrees. So for the left hand dipole, I can connect this dipole through a longer line here and another longer line here. 
So this is L plus uh, a quarter wavelength. If I can keep uh, these impedances perfectly matched, that's very important here. In order to again, and in this way, I get in this direction, I get a right hand circular polarization uh, because the field is actually rotating in this direction. This dipole, I write the hot, hot end here. Uh, so maybe may be better to use the red color. So if this, uh, this is my reference phase, the red. The red goes up here. This one is delayed with respect to this by, by one quarter period. So I get right hand circular position here. And of course, the same device in the opposite direction will radiate left hand circular position. Uh, there is yet another solution I can do it. Uh, I take one dipole as a reference. Uh, I will draw the wires to the generator with two different colors because it's maybe easier now to understand. I will draw the plus wire here and the minus wire with the blue color. So this is length L. But now I physically separate the two antennas. I put the horizontal antenna way behind. Way behind. So I put the red wire here also on the horizontal antenna and the blue wire also on the horizontal antenna. But uh, these are also of the length L. So th the antennas are fed in phase. But there is a physical offset here between the two antenna of a quarter wavelength. And this way I can also obtain uh, right hand circular polarization here. Because the horizontal component is delayed by one quarter of a wavelength. Uh, and uh, I also have uh, in the other direction, uh, here the horizontal component actually advances, I get left hand circular polarization. Uh, this may look more cumbersome to make actually, but uh, this guy here, if uh, I have identical dipoles, it's less critical to the impedance matching of the dipoles than this one here. So it's not uh, all that simple. I should, we should ca make calculations with impedances actually, and we don't have the time to do that. What is simpler to make? Uh, I can also make another trick. Make two dipoles of different lengths. So use just one generator in one single spot and uh, make what is the advancing version make the vertical dipole shorter and the horizontal dipole longer shorter v and longer h in this way the shorter dipole we have will have a slightly capacitor, capacitive uh, impedance Capacities in capacitive impedance will advance the phase on this one here. So short V will give us plus 45 degrees and longer H will give us minus 45 degrees. This is frequently, this trick is not used with dipoles as it is frequently used with patch antennas. You remember last time we were talking, uh, a few weeks ago we were talking about patch antennas. Uh, if this is a patch antenna, how do I make uh, circular polarization out of a patch antenna? I make a circular polarization out of the patch antenna by cutting corners. By cutting corners, I make this dipole shorter and this dipole longer. So the supply, the fit point should be now here. The fit point for this patch antenna should be here. The fit point. So I fit two dipoles in parallel, but this one is shorter and this one is longer. And this one, this thing will actually radiate uh, right hand circular polarization out of the board. So uh, right hand circular polarization, we get it out of the board. Uh, we do not get any left handed because it's back under, besides behind the ground plane of this patch antenna. Uh, and maybe I can show you such a patch antenna here. 
Uh, Where it is? So this is a patch antenna made of ceramic. The feed point is offset slightly up. So actually I am feeding here vertical polarization for both dipoles. But this dipole in this direction has the angles cut. So this, uh, this resonator actually has a slightly higher resonance frequency. It will advance in phase, phase while this one here will delay the phase. So advanced delay, I will get right hand circular position out as required by the GPS receiver. This is a GPS antenna for 1.5 gigahertz I have here. So this is a very simple solution built uh, for commercial GPS receivers. Uh, it makes sense because uh, to use uh, right hand circular polarizations for GPS receivers. Why? Because if you have here the satellite, If you have here the receiver, uh, if you have here the uh, right hand antenna, uh, the direct way from the GPS here is right hand circular project. But any reflection of the ground, because you also have ground here, comes with the wrong delay. So this reflection here comes with the wrong delay from ground. And this will cause errors in navigation. But this reflection of the ground, here right hand circular polarization, reflecting from an object changes the sense of polarization. So this reflected wave will be left hand circularly polarized. And with a suitable antenna, I can reject the left hand. So the accuracy of my GPS receiver will be actually much higher much better if I use circular polarization. That's a good, good reason why to make circular polarization. Uh, the same trick, delaying one wave, uh, uh, delaying one wave uh, at 45 degrees, uh, advancing the other one. The other one. Now we have this antenna here. Uh, this also it's vertically polarized. This one is delayed. And this one is advanced. This one has advances in phase, and this is delay. So this field here actually circulates in this direction. This is a left hand uh, circularly polarized antenna here. Uh, so I have delays with this uh, tuning screws here, delays, delayed. This, this polarization is delayed, while this linear polarization is advanced because there are no, uh, no capacitive loading on this waveguide. Why is this left hand? This thing was made for, uh, for receiving a right hand circularly polarized satellite. But this was actually the feed from, for the dish. So uh, if I uh, draw it here, so if I receive such a satellite right hand with a dish antenna, here I have my feed. So this uh, actually, this. Uh, right hand polarization here, when reflected off the dish, so right hand here, uh, right hand circular polarization, uh, reflected from the dish will turn, will reverse the direction because I invert the z axis here, I will get left hand circular polarization. Remember that with mirror antennas, the direction of the polarization changes. Now, the most tricky part comes in the specification. You read the specification how to receive a satellite, and the specification say, says, you need a dish antenna with a right hand circularly polarized feed. Where does that right hand circular polarization apply? Here or here? They don't tell you that. Whether the feed is right hand or the whole antenna is right hand. It just flips, flips the direction. And that's a problem. We can do the same thing using Dielectrics. Say I could put in place of the tuning screws here. Oh, sorry, I had an example of the two dipoles of different lengths. This was a short backfire antenna. And what you can see here, the actual feed is, are two dipoles, two slot dipoles of different lengths in here. 
to slot dipoles of different lengths in here to get circular polarization out of it. So I forgot that I had this sample here because I'm a little bit short with time. Uh, yes, you can do that same thing installing at 45 degrees a sheet of dielectric. I don't know where you can see this on the camera here. You see this antenna, this is the waveguide, the polarization is vertical, but I have here a sheet of dielectric here, so this axis will be delayed and this axis will be advanced, so it will rotate in this direction, the field, so in the direction of this horn antenna here, uh, this one will radiate a left-hand circular polarization. Uh, some horns are even made to be able to change the direction of polarization. I don't know whether you can see this on the camera here. Uh, now the way the, I put the waveguide is vertical, uh, but uh, I have at 45 degrees, I have the piece of dielectric inside to change the vertical into circular polarization at itself. Yes, I do have some antennas that already generate circular polarization as they are. Uh, that's a helix antenna. A helix is a slow wave structure. This one is for higher frequencies. A slow wave structure that only works for, works for one circular polarization. And such an end fire helix, uh, the polarization here matches actually the helix of the wire. So this is a right hand helix. A right hand helix in end fire operation will radiate a right hand circular polarization. This is just a smaller version, uh, but a left hand helix. This is a left hand helix, a right hand helix, and a left hand helix as we have them here. Uh, there are other kinds of helices that uh, uh, radiate uh, in a different way. For instance, the backfire helix. The backfire helix is a two wire or a four wire, a bifiler or a quadrifiler helix. That radiates the opposite polarization. So a backfire helix, uh, which is used in sometimes in satellite communications because it's, it's non-directional properties, uh, provides a very nice pattern to receive the whole hemisphere or a very nice pattern to illuminate a dish antenna. It has a very good <coughs> pattern, but uh, we should know that the polarization will be just the opposite of its helix. So we, for right-hand polarization, we need a left-hand helix. I don't have a sample right now here. Uh, we may get both polarizations also using a 90 degree hybrid. So this circuit here is a 90 degree phase shifter to have uh, both right hand and left hand out of two linearly polarized antennas. Where is the trick here? The trick here that this was used for toll collections on high highways. It's exactly the same here, with two 90 degrees phase shifters here. This phase shifter is for the two antennas here. Uh, why is this trick useful? Uh, the issue is you have this tag installed in your car. And maybe here is the tag, the toll collection tag. You have the toll station. And the toll station radiates, say, uh, right-hand circular polarization. The reflection of the surface of the car is actually disturbing. But since the direction is opposite, it becomes left-hand circular polarization. But my tag is designed in such a way that it receives uh, right-hand and also re-radiates the polarization at the right uh, uh, polarization, so it radiates here also right hand circular polarization in the other direction. So by uh, I can flip the polarization so that I can the tag is much smaller than the car. The strong reflection of the car is not disturbing the weak weak reflection of the tag. And here I can also play a lot with by choosing the correct circular polarization. So this is also a trick. Another thing that can be done. Uh, yes, we still have one final issue. I don't have the time to explain it because it's, time is running fast here. Uh, I can use uh, 
by fiber spiral, ant spiral antennas. These antennas have uh, two arm spirals made on them. Such a spiral antenna, how does it work? I have uh, a generator in between. A generator. And I have a two arm spiral. So one arm of the spiral, I draw it here. And the other arm of the spiral is just offset 180 degrees here. These two arms actually, because of different lengths, they add up in the so-called co active ring. Active ring is at co the correct direction from the center. And this active ring uh, has a circumference of about one wavelength. That's the trick how this spiral antenna works. Uh, going further out, uh, this active ring vanishes, but we may get active rings of higher higher order active rings that would corrupt our polarization and also the radiation pattern. So the trick is to make this, uh, uh, where did I put them? Oh, they are here. The trick is to make these antennas on bad laminate. This is actually lossy dielectric. This is just glass fiber epoxy, uh, quite lossy at microwaves, uh, loss tangent about 2%. And this, uh, this will suppress higher order rings, but, uh, but it will also kill the efficiency of our antenna. Uh, these cavities are usually, uh, these th antennas are usually cavity backed, so they are made like this. So this is antenna. The two arm spiral built on, uh, the two arm spiral built on a printed circuit board and cavity backed so they only have radiation in one direction. Uh, this example here, is transmitting uh, outside of the table, is transmitting a right outside of the table, is a right hand circular position. And of course, left hand in the other direction, if I don't have a cavity to stop it. I have other cavity backed antennas here. They may also be some, maybe left hand. So this is, this is also two, two, two arm spiral. Very broadband antenna, these antennas can achieve a bandwidth of one to 10. One of the most broadband antennas we can make. Yes, we have one final issue in optics. In optics, we also use B refringents, but not by inserting tuning screws or pieces of the electric in a waveguide, because everything in optics is very small because the wavelength is small. But we have quarter, quarter wavelength and half wavelength plate. So in optics, we have a material like mica, that's a crystal, that has uh, one refraction index in one direction and another refraction index in the other direction. And if this is a quarter wavelength plate, it doesn't mean that it's thick a quarter wavelength, but it means that it uh, on the vertical and horizontal polarization, they will, the path will differ, will differ by just a quarter period. Since the difference between the two refractive indices with mica is small, is 10 to the minus 2 or smaller than that. So this uh, plate is maybe several hundreds, uh, around 100 microns thick to get the quarter wavelength at optical frequency. So uh, this is the quarter wavelength plate. To get the same effect, to convert, say, linear polarization into circular polarization. And you had these experiments in the optics course last semester. Uh, finally, we have one issue that's difficult to explain in three minutes. Uh, and that is uh, uh, all this what I have today on the desk holds when? Holds when I have a, an observer that has a, has a wider bandwidth than our signal. Then the discussion about polarization is okay. But what happens, uh, this in radio is usually the case because in radios I have very narrow band signals and I have instrumentation that can handle all the bandwidth I, I would like to have. But in optics, there's a problem. In optics, I have the opposite is true, that the bandwidth of the observer is smaller than the bandwidth of the signal. 
white light has a bandwidth of a few hundred terahertz. We have no instrumentation that can handle a few hundred terahertz. That is out of reach for today's technology. And uh, uh, when this is true, then we say that we have unpolarized or partially polarized light. But uh, today I have far way too little time to explain these effects and we usually don't do it with antennas because with antennas, uh, so radio antennas, our equipment always has the bandwidth required. That does not happen in optic and if it does not happen in optic, we cannot define whether we see that the vector E is moving somewhere, but we don't know whether it's turning right or it's turning left. We don't know whether it's going to uh, just have vertical components, just have horizontal components. And that's an unpolarized light because the observer simply does not, is not fast enough to observe these changes. And then we have uh, different units, no longer the ratio of circular components Q. We have different units, we have the uh, Stokes parameters, we have the Poincaré sphere, but that's, that's way too much for today. So that's about polarization. And uh, in order to keep on schedule, we have to restart in 10 minutes with the thermal noise. <laughs>